So the thread that runs through my entire two weeks here in Tbilisi, the central idea is how technology has changed so much and how it's allowed all of us to participate in this thing that we call this international dialogue that is journalism. And, and this can be professional journalism. I've been a, a professional journalist since 1977. I now practice a thing called backpack journalism in which I can carry everything that I need to produce high-quality television documentaries or documentaries for the internet in this. At American University, where I teach in Washington, D.C., I teach my, my, my students a, 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 a sector of the craft we call it citizen journalism. And the central idea is that if you have access to one of these, and the internet, you can communicate for the first time in the history of, of, of the world. You can communicate instantly, globally, and in a language. That everyone can understand. And that's the visual language. This is what I teach. I teach the visual storytelling language. Which is a separate language. Just like Greek, Spanish, Georgian, Italian, it's a separate language. And if you look at television and the internet, sometimes I think you see a lack of ability to speak that language. That's where I come in. I brought some of my work with me from the very beginnings. Hi, Salome. Salome was in one of my was in my workshop last year. Nice to see you again. Things are good. Yes. Good. Now we're Facebook friends. How do you like that? <laughs> um, so I brought some of my work with me. I started to work as a journalist in 1977 as a reporter in Mexico City on an English language newspaper. I was a reporter for that. And I've managed to, to, to keep 
kind of abreast with these changes, this revolution in technology that's taken us from where I came, working with black and white photographs, to where we are now. So I want to share that journey with you. And if you have, and if you have questions along the way, just ask. Just raise, raise your hand, okay? Or just, yeah. Should we start? Okay. So, you know, for better or worse, my career has been marked by and characterized by and defined by my coverage of conflict. I would never encourage anyone to, to, to cover conflict because I know what the price of that can be. And I don't call myself a war correspondent or a war photographer. But the fact is that I have covered a lot of war. So a lot of what you're going to see, some of it is quite graphic. But that's what war is. It's graphic, but war is graphic. So we're going to sit so you, can, you guys can see this clearly. And I'll walk you through this. Can everybody hear me? I talk pretty loud, so you should hear me. That's okay? Or should we use these microphones? This is the first conflict that I ever covered. It's on now, yeah? So this is the first conference in Nicaragua. You know, I'm one of the few American journalists around today who covered the 1979 revolution in Nicaragua, the Sandinista Revolution. And who went on to cover the counter-revolution in the 1980s. Don't forget now, we're talking about the thread here is, is the technology that I used to use to do my job. At this time I'm working for United Press International as a correspondent and as a photojournalist. And it, everybody knows what United Press International is, yeah? It's like the Associated Press, Reuters, a wire service. So my job was to go out and cover the war, which lasted about six weeks. And this is the first time that I've ever seen dead bodies in the street. And I'm using the cameras, much like that, that Nikon that that guy's, my colleague, is carrying up on the And the conflict was very much an insurrection in the sense that you had a, a, a vast majority of Nicaraguans who were simply tired of the, the dictatorship and they decided that they had to get rid of it. Most of them had little or no uh, uh, real military training. This is Samosa's National Guard. Samosa's National Guard. The, the Dictatorship's National Guard. And these are the Sandinistas. The, the rebels, the guerrillas. Women played a tremendously important role in the revolution. 
the official name of the of the, of the Sandinistas uh, uh, newspaper uh, Sandinistas gazetis. is Barricada. Uh, which means barricade. Uh, that's and it takes its name from the barricades that the Sandinistas used to build by lifting up these stones on the highways. <laughs> and building barricades from behind which they fired at the National Guard. Uh, don't forget now to make these pictures I had to carry around my cameras black and white film chemicals and equipment to develop the film and enlarger and enlarger a photo enlarger Photograph, photographic paper, these are actually the scans, these are digital scans of the original 8 by 10 inch prints that I made 35 years ago. We had to carry around entire dark rooms, including black plastic that we taped over the windows of the hotel bathrooms where we set up base. Uh, try without that, you have to take rooms. Black plastic, uh, we, we, we taped up the, the bathrooms. We had to take all the light away to make a dark room. So we could make these 8x10 prints. We had to have a mechanical typewriter to write the captions. And then we would cut the caption paper and it had a, 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 the back of it was sticky and we'd stick it onto the, the, the 8 by 10 inch print. And in a couple of minutes I'll show you how we got the pictures from Managua, Nicaragua to New York where the UPI was based. So every day this was, you know, wake up in the morning, try to figure out where the fighting was, and, and go to where the fighting was to make pictures. Has anybody seen the movie Salvador? A couple of people, they're in the movie, there's a, a, a Newsweek magazine photographer who gets killed. That character is based on that guy with the camera holding the towel on his shoulder. That's John Holman. Holman. John Holman and I covered this the insurrection together in 1979. John and I worked together covering the war. He went on to work for Newsweek magazine. He lived in El Salvador. And he was killed in 1984. In circumstances very different from the film. But the character of the film is based on him. In these conflicts, it's always the civilians who take the worst punishment. They spend most of their time trying to save their own lives. This is the, the camera team of a, an ABC television correspondent <laughs> who was executed by the, the, the dictatorship's National Guard. The cameraman who's sitting there beside the camera filmed the execution through the, the, the windshield of the van where he was sitting. 
Amadamian Magata Yvos, or Dalis Mokulis Kadrebi, Sakadamis Ukmitan, Makanesh Tijda. The execution was broadcast all over the United States. And that was the end of the that was the beginning of the end of the dictatorship. In terms of its political support in Washington DC. These are the Sandinistas moving from one city to another. These are Sandinista rebels. This is the only member of the new government who is in Nicaragua during the time of the revolution. And again, the civilians spend most of their time fleeing from one place to another. This is the National Guard. And this is the kind of visit that you don't want to get if you're a male between the ages of 14 and 54. I have a job at American University. I have to give workshops in Washington outside of the university. I have to take freelance assignments. I have to diversify like crazy. To be able to do the things that are, that are, that are, that are really close to my heart. And I have to sacrifice things. Like the time. You know? So there are no easy answers. You have worked in professional journalism for decades. Right. And I think from this point, of course, it's, it's, it's a lot easier to actually, you know, to build an existence which around the things you want to do, you know, like you say, like I, someone who has never worked in professional journalism couldn't do the kind of stuff you do, you know, because he's not, he doesn't have a name, you know, uh, and your uh, contacts uh, to do all these things that you do to support yourself. So I, I mean, I, I just think there's a big economic problem of resources, you know, there, there are, there are. Idea. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's not easy. It's not easy. I mean, you're right. I mean, I have. I've been a journalist for almost four decades. Sorry. Yeah. We need this. So it's, it's generating an entirely new generation of mostly young people like you guys who can do this stuff. Most of you grew up with these things you know, since you were born, right? I'm having to learn all this stuff. So in a sense you have a jump on me. Yes, but there's an increasing market for this because there's an increasing awareness of people need this. You have to start somewhere. You have to start by learning. You have to start by building community. Which is key. And you build community by using the social media tools that you have at your Google my name. I have a website, Facebook pages, Twitter accounts, I do all of this stuff, and it's work, it's work, you raise your hand, go ahead, and then you're next. So, I, I, I wanted to 
class that there are lots of balance between professionalism and being just a simple human because I saw frames that were really hard for me to avoid those things and how were you handling those facts and those things in your rules and uh, now when you look back how you translate it in your mind all of those situations that you want to go through yeah, yeah, yeah I, I the mean graphic war, pictures. war and uh, death and all of this you know it just becomes so good yeah so a balance your professional journalists are that show the people that means show this and the book that we try to that the people that are correct so good it's not just everything that I read it becomes part of your life experience. You know? it, it, becomes, it becomes part of your life story. Some of it can be quite traumatic. But then life without trauma is not really life. It's not like fake life. Everybody loses their parents. Lots of people get divorced. And, and, and you, you just assume it and, and you cope it. Because you know that if you allow these experiences to really Debilitate you. Then you undermine your own mission in life. And you become you become useless. And uh, thank you for the very interesting seminar. My question is somehow connected with the previous question. Uh, how did you deal with stress? because uh, it's very difficult to forget such images and to sleep without nightmares, I guess. So, and do you think that journalists who cover the conflict, they need a special training, physical, psychological training? How, how did you do this? You know, I had tremendous support. Um, sorry, I keep forgetting, sorry. <laughs> The answer, I think, is two, is twofold. You guys can hear me in the back? Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, I think the answer is twofold. One, be before you accept the responsibility of going into those situations to work, <coughs> you have to make sure that you're willing to accept the consequences. Because if you're, if, you, if you're not ready to accept the consequences, then you completely fall apart. Before and after. In my case, you know, I've, I've often, you know, I've refused to cover certain stories because I thought they were too dangerous. But I'm still willing to, to take those risks and go to important stories. Especially when my country is involved. Because for me it's a privilege. For me to take part in this conversation about important events. It's a privilege. The second part of the answer is I've always had tremendous family support. I've had two extremely, you know, my first wife and my second wife are wonderful people. <laughs> and they've always said, this is going to make you happy. You can't ask for more than that. Yes. Um, uh, first of all, I'm interested. Do you think that with uh, that factorial, you get more uh, intimate material, uh, indifferent 
intimate and open and swimming to really in difference with professional skills. And secondly, I want to ask you about we journalists, we know the value of visual language. Yeah. But when you talk about citizen journalism, I mean citizens who report about different issues, yeah. uh, can you request visual language from them? Can you do I, what? Can you, can you, can you expect, can expect yeah, a good visual language from them? Because they are just ordinary citizens. Because I felt this difference between citizens reporting and professionals reporting with, with iPhone, for example. I felt it on myself. I, I made my first tour with my iPhone just recently from, from the border of North Korea. And I felt that I, I, it wasn't citizen, citizen journalism, it was professional reporting. Okay. I made it with iPhone, but I was, I was, it, it's, it's a big uh, You followed stress. the rules. It's a big stress, because yeah, I was thinking of, about content, about sound bites, about pictures, about right. video, everything, about together. So Where did the work go? Sorry? Where did the work go? Where was it published? Uh, it's not published yet, but it will be in the program I'm working. The answer to your first question, I think, is there's no doubt in my mind that you can get more intimate uh, uh, journalism, a more intimate form of journalism, and a more immediate form of journalism with these little tools. Not only that, but logistically, I put this program up here. I did this program in 2008. I was on, I was uh, in the Helen River Valley with a bunch of U.S. Marines. And the only reason I was able to go there with them was that I was just one person with one backpack, one little camera. If I had shown up with a conventional crew, cameraman, soundman, correspondent, producer, they, they would not have had the will to move me from These cameras not only do not intimidate, but I'm convinced that they convey the feeling. They convey the feeling that the subjects actually have some level of control over the creative process. Because we're connected without all the stuff. No $50,000 beta cam. No sound man. No producer who's writing stuff all the time. And no correspondent with perfect hair and perfect teeth. Just me and my subject. And that's like, that's like, Poetry. Were you in bed? I was in bed. Yes. Yes. Three weeks. There was, I think you were first. And then we'll go to, to the team. Uh, what do you think? Should we begin to teach this kind of uh, uh, special uh, subjects, uh, as you said, uh, citizen journalists uh, in school? Should we begin from the in my country now, they're starting to teach this stuff in high school. In fact, in July, 
I'm uh, going to a little town in the state of Kansas, which is nowhere, <laughs> for a week to teach a high school class how to do this. My students learn more from videos. They, they exchange more information with video than they do with books. They only read books because guys like me make them read them. <laughs> Otherwise, they would just watch video. I really mean it. This is the new language. I really believe it. So the answer to your question is yes. Did I answer your question? There was a, there was a second part. Let's go back to that real fast. I answered the part about about visual language citizens who report about different issues, they don't know about visual language at all. Uh, so I don't mean the about the some they, they just, they they just film. And the message is lost. Yeah, there's what she means. there's the a big difference. There's an enormous difference between <laughs> telling a visual story and illustrating a print story or a thematic story. And I really have to have more time to, to show you basic stuff about you know the systems that I use to speak the digital language. What kind of shots? What kind of camera movements? What are the implications if I shoot you like this or if I shoot you like this? Everything has a meaning. It, it really is a separate language. So I think it is important. You can do basic television reporting and not really understand how to speak the language. You can get the meaning across, but it's not going to be visually compelling. You had a question. Media language will kill the traditional media. You mean like print media? Yes. I used to. No, there's always going to be there's always going to be print print. There's always going to be reporters. There's always going to be foreign correspondents. You know, I assign my students uh, uh, when I teach this at, at, at the university. I assign one project each semester. And I tell them at the beginning of the semester, pick a story that's visual. And, you know, students come up with ideas, they want to do stories that are in the sky. Complex. Things. They don't. They simply don't lend themselves to a visual telling. Some stories are not visual. So the answer to the question, no, this is this will not kill the print, the print media. She's been waiting for that.
in my case at least, and I'm not a war photographer, I think that if you've seen just one time what, what, what one of these high-velocity bullets can do, the human flesh and bone, it's really good reason to be afraid every time you go. <laughs> but there's a difference between controlling your fear and doing your job. And allowing your fear to undermine your job. <laughs> So I try to control my fear and do my job. Does that answer your question? I have one. Go ahead. Uh, you are a civil conflict of the Bomb Show journalist. I am also, um, also a conflict journalist. I was uh, in a car during the war and I have some materials uh, the light intercepts, I press uh, practice to it, how about on a view of Levitz who show up there on this time as a female journalist who work for um, the conflict or war. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. If you look at, 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 at the big newspapers, okay, you should gather head out to deed the tips. If, if you look on television, I have said he said to me when you were my parents, I said that Olivia will do you have some colleagues while you were on this uh, field? Female colleagues? In, in, this, in this instance here? You know, this time is very warm. And so, oh, yeah. 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 If you get, I mean, do you want to leave? Yeah. I know. I think uh, we should take one last question and we call it. Anything. Let me answer her question first. Uh, number one. There. Number one. I would never encourage anybody to to cover conflict. Yes. Having said that, you can. You can do really important reporting, really important journalism. And never hear a shot fired. And never be in danger. You can go after the conflict. In the aftermath of the conflict. In the aftermath of the, of the fighting. And find out what happens to the people. I have two children in and I uh, yeah. saved my life. Okay, my okay. To the answer of the, the other part of your question, um, in, in Afghanistan, for example, female correspondents can do much more than male correspondents. Because the female correspondents, when they walk into a government office, the officials there treat them like they came from the moon. <laughs> They're just not used to dealing with women on, on, on the same level. So not only can a woman get into the government office, but she can also get into the kitchen. <laughs> and find out what's really going on. I can't get into the kitchen. I can't even get close to the women in the house. But the women can. So it's a big advantage. <laughs>